Hi, I'm Mark and I'm a developer advocate at Solace. And I'm excited to talk to you all at the first ever Async API Comp. So thank you for having me and uh, let's get started. Um, my talk is going to be on from design to code using Async API. So I'm going to, to start off um, by going over, quick over, uh, over a quick agenda here. Um, so I'll give a quick intro where I'm gonna talk about the value of real-time data and the challenges that come with it. I'm go then going to introduce you to the PubSub Plus event portal. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some COVID-19 data streams. We'll then use those COVID-19 data streams as part of a live demo. So I'm going to use the, the PubSub Plus event portal to extend an event-driven architecture um, to add a stream processor um, that will process some of those COVID-19 streams. And then I'm going to leverage Async API and its code generators to generate a Spring Cloud Stream microservice and actually process events in real time. So first to start off, I think some of you may have seen this chart before, but studies have definitely shown that data is more valuable the sooner you use it. Um, with it being most valuable you know, in real time within seconds of a change in state occurring. Um, so historically what we've seen is a lot of batch um, ETL where you peri periodically get a bunch of state changes at once. Um, you extract, transform, and load them into some sort of data store and then do historical analysis um, on that data. Um, so that's, has the least, that's getting the least value out of your data. You can of course get more value out of your data by following what I would call a store and query approach. Um, so in, in this approach, as events occur, you would actually take them, process them, and store them in a data store. Um, and then you'll have applications that will query um, the data when they need it. So in many cases, a REST API is used for this. But to get the most value out of your data, you really need to become event driven. Your systems need to be able to subscribe to events that they want to know about. And then as those state changes occur and events happen, your, your systems are notified and receive those events in real time, allowing you to process, process those events and act on the information while it's still most valuable to your business, to your organization. And this is really the goal um, that many companies are trying to achieve by going event driven. So the question is, if we want to be real time, then, then why are we not? Why are organizations not taking advantage of this? Um, and so the answer for that is because it's, it's not easy. You know, being event driven is not easy. So only organizations um, that have actually had to become real time um, have been doing that. So this diagram is actually a real diagram and it's an example, it's a, architecture of the FAA's National Airspace System. Um, and so they had a need to be real time because they need to know, you know exactly where the planes are, whether they're in the air or on the ground. They need to be alerted of weather phenomenons as they occur so they can make changes and keep people safe. Um, and so many more use cases exist throughout this, um, throughout this domain and are factored into this architecture. Um, so this diagram is actually, you know, it's a real diagram. I believe it's actually a Visio diagram. And so you can imagine um, trying to implement this system is not, is not easy. And let alone after somebody else has built the system and coming in as, an, as a new developer or a new architect and trying to determine where changes need to be made or if you're making a change, what else is being affected is quite difficult. So you know, why is this the case? And so the reason is there are a lot of reasons that it's hard to build these event-driven applications. And, and it's really the who, what, when, where questions that need to be asked. So where do you discover what events are available for reuse? You know, why does an event even exist in the first place? What topic do you subscribe to receive it? What changed? Uh, how do you determine the data structure of the payload once you know that the event actually exists? Who should I have access to it? So in many cases, there are security concerns about which systems 
can access certain data and which can't. So you want to make sure that you have those security um, rules enforced in your operational system. Who made the latest revision? So if something broke, how do you know who made the last change? Who can tell you more about it um, when you're not sure when you have such a complex architecture, you know, when you're not sure if a certain event is something that you want, who's the owner of that event? Who can I go talk to? Um, who can I check with to make sure um, to, to, to hear about when the next version is coming out? You know, is your change backward compatible? If I make a change, which systems am I, might I break? And again, who is impacted by your change downstream? And also, does it, complier, does it comply uh, with your security policy? So all of these questions are hard and you really need tooling in order to make this easier on developers and architects. And so in the synchronous RESTful world, there's a few solutions that help with this. So open API, um, the open API initiative is an open source initiative that provides a specification to define your RESTful synchronous apps. It also provides uh, swagger tooling um, to help generate code from those uh, specifications um, from the documents of that specify an app. But also there's all of these other things that you still need to do. So that's why open uh, API management platforms are available. And so these API management platforms provide an API portal that allow you to really document your applications, um, register the applications for governance reasons, analyze what's going on so you can continue to improve and to monetize on your solutions. They also allow you to participate with your community and collaborate, collaborate you know, across development teams, um, developers with architects, vice versa, to really design and implement your solution. And then of course, they allow for better productivity by using tooling such as Swagger to do code generation. So this tool set between OpenAPI and API management platforms really answers the who, what, when, where, why, and how um, for RESTful APIs. But eventing and event-driven is just different. Um, and it, the event is really the interface. Applications are decoupled. So the challenge is different and you can't use an API management platform um, to solve the event-driven, the, the who, what, when, where for event-driven architectures. So where do we go from here? Well, as you probably guessed by the name of this conference, uh, async API is providing part of this solution. So async API is of course, it's kind of risen as the industry standard for defining your asynchronous um, APIs and, and event-driven APIs. So it provides not only a specification, but it is also providing uh, code generators. So you'll be able to define your, your application as you can see on the screen here. So on the right, you know, this is a YAML representation of a async API, API document um, where you have your version, you have information about your application. You have the different channels um, that in this case, it is subscribing to and the schemas that define the message that it's going to receive. But you need more than just a specification and code generators. So like we have the API management platform for the RESTful world, we need an event platform for asynchronous interactions. So to answer the, the same types of questions, right? So we need an event portal to document, register, analyze, collaborate, and to have better productivity. So we have async API, both the specification and the code generation that I just talked about to help with this, but the platform itself has not been available until now. And so Solace is, has introduced its pub sub plus event portal. So this event portal is really the equivalent of the API portal, um, but it, for the event driven world. So it is a single place for architects and developers to go to design, to create, to catalog, um, visualize, discover, and share all of your events across your, your architecture. So now with the event portal 
uh, available, we can have a similar experience as we have in the RESTful world. So in the RESTful world, you know, we have the API management tool and it can output, you know, it, it gives you a specification, an open API document defining your app. You use Swagger tooling to do code generation. You get generated code and your apps communicate usually using HTTP. So now with the PubSub Plus event portal, you can use that to manage your entire event-driven architecture and then use async API, um, the async API specification to document your apps and use async API code generators to generate event-driven code um, and of course communicate over a whole bunch of different runtime protocols um, like AMQP, MQTT, and there's other open standards and um, out there and available. And so this is really what I want to demonstrate for you today. So I'm gonna show you the event portal and talk about um, some COVID-19 data streams. And then we'll design an app, export a specification, and do some code generation for a Spring Cloud Stream uh, microservice. So before we jump into that, just a little bit of background information here. Um, so in the event portal, you really need to know about four different things. So an application domain, which really allows you to define your different software development teams or lines of business or however you want to organize your development teams. Of course, the applications themselves, whether it's a publishing application, a subscribing application, or both. An event, so an event is um, defined by that Pentagon icon. And so an event has a topic address, but also metadata that will reference a payload schema. And then lastly, the fourth is the schema itself. So the schema could be a JSON schema, an XML schema, or of course you can define your events in many other ways as well. And so all of those things will be connected in the event portal so you can really visualize your architecture and it's an interactive graph so you can you know, zoom in, zoom out, um, move events around and really um, have a better experience understanding your architecture than, for example, the Visio diagram that we saw earlier um, from the National Airspace System. So let's check it out. So if I come over here, this is the GitHub repo that has the COVID stream processing information in it. So this is publicly available. Um, Solace is actually making this data available for free um, for anybody to use. So we're getting data from the COVID tracking project and from John Hopkins University. And essentially, we're taking it from those data sources, publishing it into Solace Pub Sub Plus, and allowing anybody to create client applications to receive that data. <clears throat> so that's what we're going to do today. So I'm going to go into Solace Cloud and log in. So Solace Cloud is where the event portal lives. So once I get into Solace Cloud, I'm going to jump into the designer here, and we're going to look at the COVID data feeds. And so in the COVID data feeds, we really have a few different um, things going on. First up here is the John Hopkins data publisher. So this is getting the John Hopkins data, publishing it out, and it's received by a cases regional splitter and a cases splitter that split the data on different things and make it available in different streams. At the bottom, and what we're gonna use today, um, is information from COVID tracking. So we have a state's current value publisher that, that queries their APIs, gets the latest information, and publish it, publishes it every 30 seconds or so. We then have a state splitter <clears throat> that is processing that data and splitting it up by state and actually only publishing events when changes actually occur. So this allows um, anybody to subscribe to these single state current data update events and only get notifications when things change. So you know, if things stay the same for five hours, you, you don't just get a bunch of events that mean nothing for five hours straight where the state today is the same, but instead you'll get an update after five hours um, that says, hey, you know, the data has changed for Florida, now you can process that. So you save on network bandwidth, you were notified in real time when something happened, and now you can process that event and take action. So why don't we add an application here um, so if I click add an application, we'll go ahead and name this application COVID tracking state test 
um, percent calculator. And so what we're gonna do, I guess I'll show you real quick. Um, this is an example event that comes out on a topic. So we've got COM COVID tracking, test states, current update, and then CT um, for Connecticut. <coughs> so the data that comes out has a whole bunch of different things in it, but a few of the things are the total test results, um, how many of them were negative, and how many of them were positive. Um, so what we're going to do is take this information and we're gonna calculate a percentage um, for each state. So because this data is for specifically for the state of Connecticut, um, I will we'll receive the event. Of course, we'll receive events for every state, but we'll process them you know, one at a time as they occur in real time. So we'll say, all right, well, what we wanna do is provide a new event that will just public, publish the percentages. And so what that event might look like is something like this. So it might have the state in it, the total test results, um, the date checked and the date modified, how many cases were positive and negative um, from the tests, and then the percent positive and the percent negative. So that's really what we want to create. So I generated the schema here, and so I'm gonna go ahead and copy that. We might use that in a minute. So let's bounce back over here and we'll describe this as um, application that calculates and publishes um, negative and positive um, test results with percentages. All right. And I'll add myself as the owner. And then I want to subscribe. I want to manage my events here and I really want to subscribe to the um, COVID tracking single state current data update event. So I'm gonna select that event and then click save. And so we can see on the graph here, we now have our new application. It's subscribing to the single state current data update events. But what we also wanna do is um, publish a new event so if I come back in here and I say, you know what, I want to add a new event. Um, so we're going to say COVID tracking um, single state, because we're only going to send it out for single state at a time, test percentages update. And so we're going to say um, event that contains percent positive and negative tests. and we want to publish it um, on this topic. And so now we need to add our payload schema as well. So if I click add a new schema, um, can copy a few things in here. So we're going to name our schema. It's a JSON schema and the description is going to be event with test results, uh, test results, including percentages. So now I actually need this schema from before. So we'll throw that in here and we'll click save. Oh, percent data two. Hmm. So we'll click save on that. We'll save our event. Ah, must have already had these events from before. So we'll do two. All right. So now that we have that event, this it's marked as new. So we wanna publish those events. So we wanna add that as events published and click save. So now we can see in our little graph here, we are now publishing that new event. And so now as a developer, I wanna actually develop this application. And so I have all the information in my design. I collaborated with my architect to make sure everything was accurate. And now I can obviously code this from scratch, but I don't want to code it from scratch. I want to use async API code generators. So I'm going to go to async API here, choose the YAML and click download. And what this actually did is export an async API document. And so in here, under, under components, it has a bunch of different schemas. So we've got our two different schemas, um, one for the input data, one for the output. 
We have the messages that our, that our application expects to send and receive. And we have the channels here defined that, we, that we're going to subscribe to subscribe to receive the, the events coming in and publish um, for the events coming out. So there are a few things that we're still working on with the code generator here um, as part of the async API community. One of those is it doesn't yet support dynamic topics. So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of the dynamic piece of this topic. And there's an extension, XSCS function name. And so what this will do, uh, let's call it calculate percentage, is it will kind of, it will correlate um, these channels together. So when I subscribe to this channel and receive an event on there, my application is going to expect to publish on this channel, um, kind of one event in, one event out. Um, I'm building kind of a, a stream processor here um, that's going to, to do that. I also want to create a destination name here, um, access XCS destination. So I'm gonna use the solace binder. So by using this, um, it will actually create a queue for me to make sure um, that I queue up my events. So if I, if I go offline, you know, I'll still have them to consume later. So I wanna do calm COVID tracking, and then um, let's see, I'll call this calm COVID tracking, and then um, calculate percentage dot Q, why not? That should work. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this document. So now we need to do code generation. So let me bounce over here to the terminal. I'm in the temp async API, API conf directory, which is empty. And so let me copy a generation command over here so we all don't have to watch me painfully type this. And so make it a little bit bigger so you can see my screen. Oops, clear. Make it a little bit bigger, fit the screen, paste the command. All right, so this is using the async API code gener generator um, with the Java Spring Cloud Stream template. So let me actually show you the template real quick. We're using this template here. Um, and so this is as part of the async API GitHub org, you can find it in there. And what it does is it's going to take in an async API document and output a Spring Cloud Stream microservice. So you can look at here and see you know, how it works, how it knows what methods to create, what they're named, um, how to use the template. So all that, all that is here, as well as some different parameters um, to specify. So for this in particular, I'm outputting to a COVID tracking test percent calculator directory. I'm using the solace binder. I want this, the actuator to be included in my spring project. Uh, it is a Maven project. So we're gonna specify an artifact ID and a group ID. I'm specifying the Java package. So the generator is going to take the, the schema um, for the objects that were included in the async API document and actually generate POJOs um, from those. And so those are gonna be placed in this package. I then am specifying, because I'm using the solace binder, I can specify my host, my username, my password, and the message VPN. Um, so this will actually configure my connection information for me, so I don't have to worry about inputting that after. I'm then pointing here at my async API file. Let me actually make sure it's the right one. Tracking state. Um, test. So I think this is the one we just edited. Let me just make sure that is correct really quick. COVID tracking state test percent calculator.yaml. Correct. All right, and then I'm putting the um, template at the end. So I'm gonna let that go and run. And hopefully here we'll get success. All right, perfect. So our jet, my shiny files are located here. So let's go ahead and import those into my IDE. So if I say import um, general, actually, no, I want Maven. It, it created a Maven project, so I want to do existing Maven project. Hit next. And then hopefully here, if I go to browse, temp, basic API conf, hit open here. 
cool, there's a palm, so hit finish. And so I'm using the spring tool suite, so it'll actually recognize this as a spring project and give me some, some niceties to go with that. So we have got, we've got a red X, um, but that's okay, we're gonna fix that. So here's what we generated, it's a regular Java project. We can see everything's under our package that we specified. We have these two classes here, the COVID tracking state current data and COVID tracking state current test percent data too. And so these objects were generated. And so everything's all nice and in here. We've got you know, everything that was in the schema. We've got getters and setters so we can access the data. So now we can go ahead and just use this to code up our app. So application.java is really where, the, where the, the function, where you write your actual business logic. So we come in here, we basically have an add business logic. And so what we wanna do is we don't wanna return null. We want to return input. We're going to calculate the input. Um, and so the input here in Spring Cloud Stream is actually defined um, by this object here. So we're taking in the state current data and we're outputting the state current test percent data to object. Um, so what I want to do is say, I want to create a new one of these. So output equals new return output. Um, so the output object is what we actually want to create. So as part of this, uh, what we probably want to do here is get the state so that, that the data is for. So if we say input.get state, we can get our state. Um, why don't we print this out? System.out.print line um, state update received for that state. All right, and then what we want to do on our output is start to set our data. So output dot set, set the date check. So we'll take the date check from the input and put that in there. Set date modified. Again, we'll get it from the input. the number of negative cases from the input. And the positive cases. So I'm just populating my, my new event, right? And so, so you'll notice here that I, as, I, as I type, I'm just, I'm just um, putting my business logic in here, right? I didn't have to wire up any messaging stuff. And the reason for that is Spring Cloud Stream abstracts a lot of that from you. Um, so this is just a regular spring bean, which is, which is awesome. It's really the, the benefit of using spring cloud stream. I don't have to go you learn how to use the Solace APIs or the Kafka APIs or the rabbit um, APIs in order to become event driven. It's really easy on the developer. Um, so I want to do that. And then just to take a little bit of a shortcut here, cause I'm running low on time. Copy some code I have on the other screen. Um, so let's uh, do this. And so essentially what I did here was add, um, I calculated the percent positive and the percent negative um, just by dividing the number of positive cases by the total test results and the same for negative. And then I'm going to print it out. So the last piece I wanted to look at real quick before we run the app is actually the application.yaml file. So this is where all the bindings um, in Spring Cloud Stream goes. So this was generated from the async API document and put straight in here so the developer didn't have to care. So it actually specifies um, our function, the bindings and how um, they bind to the different destin topic destinations. And then they even put it in all our credentials here. Um, to connect to the event broker. So now that we have that, we should be able to just run this as a Spring Boot app because Spring Cloud Stream is based on Spring Boot. And let's see if my Mac has enough memory to continue running. There we go. All right, so it's a Spring app and it's running. Oh, I need to make one quick change to it actually. 
remember earlier I mentioned that the application doesn't yet support dynamic topics. So I just need to put in a greater than here to say subscribe for everything. Um, I'm also, so we don't have to sit here and wait for updates to happen. I'm gonna to subscribe to a test stream here. So let me make those changes and then run this again. Mm -hmm. So now it all started up, it connected to the event broker. And pretty soon as events come in, we should start to see them be processed. Um, so I think the test events happen every 30 seconds or so. Um, so let's see. But so while we wait for the events, I just wanted to point out, you know, how this can really improve the event driven experience. Oh, there we go. We're getting events. But you can see how quickly we went from design to code. And this was all because of async API and the ability to use the pub sub plus portal. So that's all I have for you. I want to say thank you. Thank you for watching the talk. Thank you for sticking with it me the whole time and watching my horrible coding skills as I typed everything out. Um, if you want to check out any of the resources that I used, I've added some QR codes here on the screen. So feel free to scan these with your phone. The first is to try the PubSub Plus um, for free. So this allows you to use the PubSub Plus event brokers and also check out the event portal that I used for the design portion. The middle here is the COVID-19 event stream um, GitHub repo. So these are the event streams that are available um, for free for anybody to use. And let's see what you come up with. Let's see how we can um, help people analyze the COVID-19 data and you know, improve things for everybody in this time of need. And then also on the right here is the Async API Spring Cloud Stream Code Generator uh, template that I used. So again, thank you. Enjoy the rest of Async, Async API Conf. Have a good day.